I have to sing a song that I wrote in 1978. Who are you? About His Holiness. And you all know the words. John Keck, he's the father of Heck. John Keck, personal friend of mine. He started Hex in New York, Boston, and D.C., Tucson, and Chicago. He did it all for you and me. That's John Keck. He's the father of Heck. John Keck, personal friend of mine. What was your first impression when you met John Keck? Uh, I was kind of fascinated, kind of like, wow, he's really out there in the sense of very open and friendly, pulled me in right away, felt like his best friend, kind of accepted me, teased with me a lot, made me feel comfortable with who I was. <laughs> I met John before there was a heck. I met John when there were still the, the Teenage Encounter Christ retreats, and I always thought he was a fun guy, zany, and that would be a good word. And I'm a little scared of him, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, warm and loving, and uh, as much as you would be like, is it, and then all this, is this guy for real? And then you say he's very real. What was your first impression when you met John Keck? Oh my goodness, um, that guy's crazy. <laughs> But he's wonderful at the same time. You know? What was your first impression when you met John Keck? Uh, he was weird. <laughs> he was not a personal friend of mine then. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was. I, that really was my first impression. Right. This guy's strange. <laughs> yeah, way out there. Uh, you had a long background in, um, in teaching disability and suddenly you were on the other side of that. Yes. And it was good preparation in a way. <laughs> it's, it's strange when you become disabled. Because you weren't at one time. No. But Why do you say it's strange? <laughs> well, because people treat you like a piece of furniture. I went into a shopping center one time and this man said, hello, how are you? And I'd never been there before. And I said, hello, how are you? And and he said, oh, it's good to see you again. I said, I've never been here before. And he said, yes, I remember the chair. So suddenly you're remembered as a piece of furniture. I don't like that. Also, people ask <laughs> if somebody was pushing me and we were in a cafeteria or something. <laughs> the best one was, does he eat peas? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> ask me, you idiot. But I tried to be nice. Um, and because it puts you in the situation, if you can't do it, you'll put up with a lot. If you can't. If you can't do, you know, if you can't go to the bathroom by yourself, get up the stairs. you'll put up with a bunch of abuse because you still got to pee. You got to go. You know? <laughs> and that's the way it is. <laughs> So that must have been a big transition for you, because no, prior to yes. but prior to your becoming disabled, you were a very active person, right? I mean, I'm still active, hyper but I mean, you yeah. were physically riding horses and doing oh sure, that, yeah, that were not doing farm work, bouncing around. <laughs> and you had grown up. Um, you were raised Mennonite. I was. My mother was Mennonite. My father had been. I think his family was Methodist, but. <laughs> when the Methodist married the Mennonite, we went toward the Mennonite. Uh, <laughs> and what was, was that a very strict upbringing? Yes. How so? Well, first of all, God was extremely stern. Now, that's is in the 40s, and maybe God was stern with everybody. I don't know. But definitely a man with a long beard who carried a book and kept records mostly of what you did wrong. Let's talk about the accident. What is the accident? What is that? Well, I would like it to be a motorcycle accident or a football accident. I fell off of a swing. <laughs> I had this little boy, Danny, who was afraid of everything. I, I don't know. Somebody had taught him 
to be fearful of uh, even playing ball, of anything. I mean, he was just frightened. Uh, I have my own opinions as to who caused that, but that's that's not right. Um, and anyway, so it took me all year to get him <laughs> to even chance sitting on a swing. And then we sat and we gradually began to, you know, if I would sit on the next one, we would swing. And then it got, finally by May, we were really ripping. And one day I was out swinging with him, <laughs> trying to get him going. And uh, the S hook came out of my swing. And I came down on blacktop. <laughs> And I, oh, I knew life had changed. Um, but you were collapsed, but then there was more because you had to get those kids back to the school. You bet I had to get them in. So I got up and walked into the school and got him off the swing and got him in class. And then we called the ambulance. Uh, <laughs> once they were in, I broke my spine. I broke the bones in my spine. And set me into a very long recovery period. Um, like, oh, what period, of, how long were you in recovery? Oh, I was in the hospital for almost a year. Um, and then, but I came back, and the doctor said I went back too soon, but I came back to school, and the first thing I did, because I was using a chair at that time, I went out to the swing, and I got on the swing to show Danny. <laughs> then the, the I went back in January and made it till, I mean, this happened in May, and I forced myself back in January. Um, the kids were wonderful because I couldn't do things. And all the, these are really supposedly rough, you know, nasty kids. And I didn't have to bend for, to open a drawer. They were there doing it. I had a bed in my classroom because they had to teach social studies lying down uh, in the afternoon because I couldn't make it. The district was, was very nice to let me come back. And I made it again from January till March and couldn't do it. So then it was off again. Oh, no, no, that's the one. One, two, three. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. So being 40 is generally, after the party, a time to take stock. With heck, it's a time to look at what we hoped for in 1973 when Nancy Malum and John Saltzman and I sat in my carport uh, and in the living room on Palin Road in Hopewell Junction, New York, and began to dream heck into some kind of reality. Nancy and I, as educators, uh, were very concerned about outcomes. <laughs> Saltzman, who loved dinners and hated things, uh, had a different focus. So as Nancy and I worried about things like, are we doing this for our own egos? Saltzman took another bite and considered the importance of the universe. And what he said in an offhand manner, has haunted me forever. If it's of God, it will last. If it's not, it'll die. We were at the beginning associated uh, with the tech community in New York. Early on, we realized that we needed to go our own way. And so we did. That, and then that's when Patty Coffer and Francine yeah sat me down and taught me about designing retreats, <laughs> which I needed to learn. 
And that's when we came up with this basic structure that we've been using for the last 40 years. Of course, Heck will also die one day, hopefully because Heck will no longer be necessary. In the meantime, our principal task is to keep it of God. I'm getting old. All right, now. <laughs> <laughs> we had a hack this past May in New York, and as usual, it was filled with the confusion of our own making. There were old people, young people, a visit from the Austin Fire Department, <laughs> and all the in-betweens in attendance. There were folks who had not been on heck for many years, some who had been around most of heck's life, and several brand new folks who had never before experienced the spirit moving among a group of ordinary people. It set me to thinking about our goals that we set way back in the worst names forever ago. <laughs> One, to share the good news of Jesus alive in our world. Two, able-bodied and disabled coming together before the mystery we call God. Three, the recognition that indeed we are all handicapped. Four, age should not and does not make any difference when it comes to God. Five, heck should never be restricted to one faith or one denomination. If God is God to all, then all got to be welcome. We must... Six, we must remain always at the mercy of the Christian community for our financial uh, survival. We should be poor. That one we've got. <laughs> Seven, if people take time to talk with each other and sincerely seek God, God will be among us. Then I began to think about how blessed those early hex were gathered together in one room at Mary Immaculate School, a couple doors from here in Asing, and later at Hiddenbrook and Deacon, where people who were creative and loved God and allowed God to mess with their lives. I was told once by a member of the Tech Council, the governing body, that I had asked too many smart people to come on heck. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, first of all, he accepted. Uh, but they chose to come. Pat Colfer was there on the first heck, and she brought folks from D.C. and later began Metro Heck. Don Howard, who arranged for the National Guard to do our food for the first heck, because the cook got sick the day before. So we had walkie-talkies and jeeps running back. <laughs> When he was transferred to Port Huachuca in Arizona, felt the need to begin heck there. Sean Tracy, when transferred to Villanova, began heck in Philadelphia. Nancy, who went for her doctorate in Boston, began heck there. It was bump was it bumpy and messy, you bet. Later, Dennis Kennedy and Julie Cutter started heck in Chicago and then St. Louis. It sort of grew like weeds. One day I got a letter from the sister Eileen Casey who was studying disability in Wisconsin and she asked me if she could come to a heck here in New York and I said well why don't you save the plane fare and meet me a couple weeks later in Chicago because I was going there for a heck and she did and that's how the heck began in Melbourne, Australia. Wow. A couple, Art and Mary Agnes Schoenenberger, drove up from New Orleans. They were on vacation, so they stopped by for a heck at uh, Beacon, and then went home and started New Orleans heck. Susie Karras came to heck in the early days and hasn't left since. Uh, <laughs> she's been a valuable driving force here in New York and is chiefly responsible for heck going to the Philippines. So we grew like weeds, wherever the Spirit scattered the seeds. And true to Saltzman's word, when it was of God, it prospered. It's 
some communities things have changed, but the communities are still strong. And alas, some communities did die. Uh, the communities that were trying to do things, nice things for poor cripples, didn't make it. All right. <laughs> when we were five years old, we had a dinner. At the, at the same we had at 10 years old. And when we had lasted 15 years, we celebrated in a big way with a four-day conference a couple doors down here, the, the place that's now a place for folks with Alzheimer's. Uh, that's where we were. <laughs> Maybe we'll go back. <laughs> folks came all over, from, the, all, from all over the United States, from Australia and from the Philippines, have truly been fishers of people who have made us grow. Old people, middle-aged people, and lately young people uh, place themselves before God, who just might call them. <clears throat> we have been and are totally surrounded, truly surrounded, by a great company of ordinary, regular, everyday things. Look around. We'll go out the world. <laughs> so to the future. People keep asking me, what happens when you die? <laughs> Who knows? Hopefully they'll bury me. <laughs> I already paid for the plot. <laughs> what happens to heck is not up to me. It's up to you guys and up to God. For you, John, from Candy. John Hack, the father of Hack. <laughs> what can one say about such a man? How can one describe someone who has touched so many lives? How can so many thank him for all he has done, for all he has been to each of us? We can start by recognizing his effect on each of us. Think of the ways our lives have been enriched made better by his example, his encouragement, his praise. Inspiration. Think of all the people enlightened, uplifted, given the courage to continue their journey. Yeah. Lighter of heart and soul because of his insight, his assurance that we do have self-worth and do matter, do have our own purpose in life. He always encouraged us to do our best, be the best we could be, follow God's path for each of us. On this 40th anniversary of Heck, I'd like to personally thank John for all he is, has been, and will be in my life and in the lives of the rest of my family. I'm sure each of you in his Heck family feels the same, as I'm sure all the students he has mentored do as well. What a wonderful blessing you have been to each of us. Thank you. Please know that I am there in spirit, even though my body isn't cooperating right now. Congratulations on a job well done. Lots of love, Candy. What's that mean? To, what's it mean to be broken? And then the realization that everybody's broken. Yeah, and that and that it's it maybe it's all right to be broken, uh, and and. And God loves broken things and people. 